YouTube family. Today I have a very special person I'm going to have you meet. And some of you have met him already in a prior video, but this is my dad. This is my dad, Ora Miller. And dad, how old are you? I'm 87. 87 and still going strong. And uh, mom, also I'm going to introduce you to mom. She's sitting over here. And this is my mom. This is Orpha. How old are you, mom? 87. Mom's also 87. Her and dad are only a few months apart in age, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're both, we're very thankful that mom and dad are both with us still. And mom is a lot slower than she used to be. Mom, you'll hear some of our story, mom and dad's story here shortly. But mom and dad uh, have been married for many years. And I'm actually the youngest of the family. But let's get into the story. Let me start asking dad some questions. And uh, we're going to just see where it goes, but I think you're going to be uh, very entertained and find it very interesting in the story of my parents' lives. So here we go. Okay, Dad, let's start with what year were you born? Uh, July 26, 1934. And that was um, about what time frame as far as the wars were concerned? That was between... Was right after the Depression, I didn't... Uh, go through the depression, but, but we were we lived in the aftermath of the depression, and and we had a good life. Never thought, never even realized that we we're in a depression for that matter. But but life went on, and so that's that's the start of my life. Uh -huh. So, Dad, how many siblings did you have in your family? There was twelve in our family when I grew up. And you're where you're towards the I'm older. The, I'm the fifth one. Okay. So 12 children, dad's number five, and are you the oldest living right now? I'm the oldest living, yes. Yeah. Why don't you just tell, tell the listeners about your, about mom, uh, how many were in her family? There was 14 siblings, well, 14 children in mom's family, and we were, well... So, so, but mom was the oldest of 15, yes. right? She was the oldest of 15. Okay, so there, was, so there was 15. No, no, I'm sorry. She was the oldest of 14. Okay, so the oldest of 14 children, and then, then what happened? And she lost her life. Her mother lost her life when she was 15. Right. And there was 14. 14 children. Mom was 15. Mom was essentially a mom at age 15, with her youngest sibling being three months of age. And then her dad remarried um, and to a... A widow and she had six children six children that made 20 and then they had how many together yeah, there were 23 children 23 all together yes so they had another uh, some a few more babies together so mom said her dad always mentioned said that uh, when her mom and her dad were uh, speaking they would say you know your children and my children are fighting with our children so Big family. They weren't really fighting as such, you know. They right. Just, just the saying, yeah. Yeah, but that, but never right. that made it made a good remark about right. uh, how it came about. So tell me about your childhood, uh, like from the time you were born in '34 until, you know, maybe about age 15 before you joined the youth group. Well, I joined the youth group. Well, uh, it was a normal life. We were always a, we were a happy family. We had uh, we had some my 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 folks had also also some disappointments. They lost a child at three years old, and I was nine. Uh, she had at that time scarlet fever was a dreaded disease, and we got the scarlet fever. And my three-year-old sister passed away. She also she also had rheumatic fever, and that's what caused her death. So to speak. So That's scarlet fever and rheumatic fever. Yes. Really, both. Wow. Okay. So, you, what about some of the things you did growing up? Your, your dad raised mint. Is that right? Yes, we raised still? mint. It wasn't the big... When, when we had the last, the last place that my folks lived, there wasn't a lot of mint soil ground there for mint, but we, we had like, a, oh, from six to ten acres of mint uh, most of the time. Okay. And that was a small... Mount that uh, small amount of acreage that we had mint that we raised mint. Okay, so at age 16, it's, it's the Amish tradition for 
if you're age once you turn age 16 then you get to join the youth group so between age 16 and you get you were how old were you when you were married okay yeah at 16 I didn't have any desire and so to speak to, to join the, the youth as such and I didn't go to very, very many places I didn't have a horse and buggy at that time but but when I turned just before I turned 17 my dad gave me a horse and buggy then I was free to go and and I started attending the, the the young folks meetings so on so forth scenes and whatever and I, then I enjoyed that very much for that matter uh, and then we then I had to go to service at the uh, age of 20. So what talk to them, us about the service well uh, we were talking about that we were what was called conscientious objectors to war and so we didn't have to go to the army we went we had to serve as, as a civil service and I worked at a hospital for two years to do my service in. And, and what year, what war was that? That was in the Korean War. Okay. It was from 1954 to 56. Because there was a draft, so you had to yes, go. It was, yeah, I, had to, I was called when I was 20 years old and I, I was in the service for two years and I was, I get, I get to get home once a week. Uh, no, once every two weeks to start with, and after a while, they had the 40-hour work week installed. Before that, we worked 50 hours or something like that, and then we were down to 40 hours a week. Then I had off every every week. One on Sundays. <clears throat> uh, every two weeks on Sundays, and uh, and during the the other uh, uh, off time, I was just stayed in the, at the hospital. I didn't go home for the two weeks mm -hmm. normally. Okay. So, um, how old were you when you got married? We were 22. Okay, 22 years old, so 16 to 22. And then uh, then you lived in Indiana. That's where Dad grew up, is in Mom in Indiana. And in, in LaGrange County, Indiana, it's the, was the third largest Amish community, you know, something like that. And how, how long did you live there after you were married before you decided to move? We were... We, Moved in '75. We got married in '57, and lived there till till the year '75. We moved to Rexford, Montana. Okay, so 13 years, something like that. Is that right? '57, yeah, or it'd be you know 18 years. Yeah, so you lived there because the oldest Arlene was she was 15. 15 when you moved, or so. Okay, so '57 to '75. So once you. Uh, how many children did you have in Indiana before you moved to Montana? Oh, you were you were the only one. Yeah, the, yeah, right. right. Okay. okay, I was the only one born, not born, in in Indiana. Yeah, she right. She born nine children in Indiana. Right. Well, let's just talk about that for a minute. Some of the things that happened in Indiana. Um, talk to us about your firstborn uh, son. That was a stillborn. A uh, firstborn son. We lost him at birth uh, because what happened. My wife went on a like on a quilting or something like that, and she met a. Uh, she had my, uh, not not my. I said, I I had our, our horse and buggy to go to work. Therefore, she had to. She used my, my her, her brother's buggy horse and buggy uh, that lived just about a quarter of a mile from where we lived, just down the lane from the from my folks my wife's folks place, and she, when she. Come on her way home. She met a a tile, what we call a tile ditch machine. It was a big machine, and it took up the whole road. And there was a ditch on either side, and there was not wasn't enough room for them to to pass without kind of going the little ditch. And then the horse took the extra extra space that wasn't really there, and the buggy tipped over, and she fell out of the buggy or in the against something, and she. Got some. She got bruises, and that caused her to abort the the baby uh, a little later. So it was a stillborn so our son. First, yeah, our first uh, son didn't live. Uh, didn't live. To, uh, she was. He was. He, he died at birth. So that was a very difficult thing for dad and mom, as only parents can imagine. And uh, and then dad and mom uh, had Arlene, Irvin, Lloyd. LV, uh, is that right? No. Neil, uh, baby. Arlene, 
Irvin, Lloyd, Leona, Leona, and then uh, Vernon after Leona. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then LV. So Vernon passed away as well from horse and buggy accident at age nine years old. So you want to say anything about that, Dad? How that happened? Well, there's, there's yeah. I'll just kind of go over the the high high points. Uh, he went on a little mission. He was always a very, uh, uh, how will I say it, ambitious little boy. He never, he always minded well and did did a lot of st things. We did. I sent him on an errand to with a team, uh, and and he got there. I was going to meet him at a certain place, and he got there before I got there, and so I asked him. Did you have to wait long? He said, no, Dad, not long. So anyhow, that was just the last words that he said that I recall. And So he was actually taking water uh, to um, out in the field to his older brothers. And my two older brothers were working in the field, uh, Sons, yeah. cultivating corn and so on, and, and he, he took water back to them. And in the meantime, there was a, uh, our horse was a steady horse normally, but, was, but there were flies and that, at that time that really bugged the horse and he started to it walk. Middle, and, like 1st of July. Yeah, he started to walk and then pretty soon he, and our Vernon was going to get off of the buggy. And then when the horse started walking, he went to get the lines and then he started to running a little bit and pretty soon he started to galloping and he, he ran away. And he turned the corner on the road back home and he flew off the wagon and on the blacktop road and, and he got instantly uh, killed so that was tough. Yeah so nine years old so that was a sad sad time dad and mom buried two children in Indiana um, so then you moved you moved to Montana in 75 and you had then you had LV and Becky and Lori uh, as well in Indiana so that was um, you brought seven children out with you, mm -hmm. and then um, I was born in '80. But um, what were some? Well, tell us a little bit. What made you decide? You and Mom decide to move to Indiana, uh, out of Indiana, into this. I mean, at that time, moving from you know central the United States to Montana in 1975, especially in the culture that Dad and Mom grew up in, was quite a quite a step, quite a move. It's kind of like, you know, us moving to Alaska or, you know, across the other side of the world or something. <laughs> so... It was unheard of. It was, it was uh, beyond uh, beyond reason that a person would want to move from Indiana to Montana. It was... Uh, it wasn't it wasn't easy, but, but it wasn't easy uh, putting up with some things that we had to put up back there because I started to, to do history quite a bit at a young age already. I started to do a lot of, a lot of, uh, I read a lot of books in regards to our Anabaptist background. And then I, and when we got married, I worked on the carpenter trade and I got in contact with a lot of people. And they always all had their, their way of, their, their way of religion. And I was always curious about those things and we had a lot of conversations and I, the more conversation we had, the more I studied to, to prove myself right, because I thought the Amish were the only ones that really had it together and everybody else just didn't quite get it. But I wanted to prove myself right, but the more I studied, the more I proved myself wrong. I, and we weren't the only ones that, that were living right, and, but because I was a little on the outside of the, the mainstream Amish churches, I got a lot of flack. And, and it got in such a uh, um, severe case that I had to re, re, I had to to promise something that I could not keep, and I couldn't do that. It came against my uh, my better knowledge to to agree with something that was not not that I couldn't agree with. Therefore, I knew the time was uh, the time was going to come where they're going to be uh, going to be disfellowshipped and kicked out. So I thought, well. Uh, I had a chance to go to Montana, so I thought that might be the, the best option to get away from that without getting uh, in the band or whatever, you know. I thought just be a, a easy way out. Of course, I didn't realize it wasn't all that easy, but 
but we did that and we were I never I never regretted that either for that matter it was it everything wasn't just uh, peace and uh, uh, pie and cake but it was it was a well uh, disciplined way of learning of learning and, and getting into a place I wanted to have a church how the Bible taught taught in first Corinthians 14 worth uh, verse 26 to 30 right in there is a is a pretty much a, a, a example how the churches come together and I realized we weren't doing that and I wanted something better than that and we had it for a number of years in, in Rexford, Montana, it's where we moved to. Uh, we moved to a place that was that was back in the sticks. I didn't realize how far back it really was. So in other words, it was it was kind of back in the sticks. That's the point Dad's making. Yeah. So when I got there, I didn't realize this this really that bad. That uh, it wasn't it wasn't bad, but it wasn't what I was looking for for a place to be living. But nevertheless, I I wanted to make the best of it, and I thought. That's ex that's actually better than what we have to do because I didn't, I thought this would be a way to to, to have, have, have maybe have a church the way it should be and 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 be a, be in a place where we, they they couldn't really reach us because we're too far away from home. So I, I know a lot of you watch uh, watch our channel because you're uh, interested in you know homesteading and I'd say Dad and Mom were the the real homesteaders because they moved out to a place that was just woods, really just woods, uh, obviously no electricity, no water. And there was years, I remember, even up until I was probably about 10, 9 or 10, before we actually had running water in our house. And we just always had an outhouse and, of course, no, no electricity at all. Um, so that's the way Dad and Mom came from. And, you know, it was truly homesteading. So they built a home out of the woods. And that's where dad and mom, that's where you started your log home business. Um, in 1980, about the year I was born, you built your first log house, actually. And my brothers built a log cabin back in the woods uh, just for fun. Just a tiny little cabin, probably about 8 by 10 or something, 8 by 12. And that kind of started the idea of maybe we could actually build a log home. So that's really where the roots were. And I'm grateful to dad for moving to Montana because I love the West and I love everything about uh, living here. So grateful dad for that. Okay, one thing I want to mention that actually my two oldest boys, Irvin and, and Lloyd, started the log home business by building a little cabin on the on the on the creek. And they had uh four walls, of course, and a door, entry door, and then they let a little fireplace one 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 end of it, and on the on the wreath on the top of the fireplace there was a little uh, motto which says, I need no mention here below. And that cabin actually still stands. Um, it's amazing after all these years, um, a lot of years, it's, I guess it'd be over 45 years later, it's still standing there without any stain no, or metal with, roof with no or anything like no that. no maintenance. Yeah. Uh, the roof is, is kind of rotting, but we need to put a new roof on there uh, to keep, then we, that thing will last another couple hundred years. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Tell us about some of the obstacles you faced when you moved to Montana, um, or in Montana. What were some of those things that, I mean, short of, you know, hacking a home out of the, the woods, Well, there were some we, things that you that happened you know, with the sawmill and everything. Okay, well, the, the thing is, when you move to it, you go to Montana, when you live in Rome, you do as the Romans. And when we lived to, to, Rex, got to Rexford, I looked around and see what, what kind of occupation would be a good occupation to have. Well, there was only one way to look, and that was trees. And I thought, well, maybe a sawmill. I, I had some experience uh, working with a sawmill, but never run a sawmill or such. Never cut any lim timber, timber on a sawmill. But I thought, we can, we'll learn that. And, and I thought we just have to maybe saw logs. That's the only thing we could really think about doing. Uh, because you couldn't work construction work because it was too far to go to, to start do any work any construction work whatever so so we we did we bought a, we bought us a sawmill and started sewing, sewing logs it was that wasn't easy because you had to go like 50 miles to get to the first machine shop to do any work in, in, in case we needed and there was a lot of that that had to be done building a sawmill because we, we bought one that already was was working but it always it needed quite a bit of uh, 
a lot of things that it needed. And, and it was started. this was a, a circle saw. And yeah, it was a big circle saw. With a big saw. blade that, that spun five, around that was not foot, accurate. <laughs> yeah, five foot circle saw. Scrag mill, is that what you call it? No, we had a scrag okay. mill too, but that's, that's okay. a different, that's a okay. different saw mill. So you were, what were we sawing when you first, these railroad cants? Yeah, we had, no, we saw railroad ties. Ties, yeah, or what, yeah, yeah. Okay, railroad ties. Yeah, we had, we bought a railroad ties contract with the sawmill, came with the sawmill, so that, that's one reason we bought this, this sawmill, because it had a contract for selling railroad ties, and, and so we, we had a guy that had a little uh, two-ton truck, and he would haul these load of, load of ties to the place where they do the, uh, On the creosote, the, or? Creosote, yeah, yeah where okay. they do the, uh, Right. Sealing the, them. Yeah, seal, yeah, they dip them in the stuff, but, yeah. so, so then what happened? Tell us about what, well, then, how many years you had. Well, then, we were sawing about, about a year and a half or so, just getting a really good start, I just dug in really good, and it was, we, we, I enjoyed it, and we, we were doing okay, because we finally got the kinks all worked, pretty much all worked out, and we were really kind of streamlining it, and we were sawing lumber, and all of a sudden, it all came to nothing. Uh, we had a, a fire at the mill, and it burnt to the ground, and it was just nothing less, left but ashes, and so we had to start all over with, with just simply, about nothing, we thought we had nothing, but we said, but, but God was with us, we always, we turned it over to Him, and He said, we, we just said that this, that's beyond our uh, ways, that we can know how to get past this, or how we get over this, and to get started new with, without a sawmill, without anything, and we had invested heavily in timber sales, and that, but that's what we still had, that, but we didn't know how to use it because we had, didn't have a mill to saw it on. So a neighbor came, a neighbor came by and they said, uh, would you be interested in sawing in, in the shares because he knew we had a lot of timber out there. I said, I'm open to whatever. So, so we started, so we bought a sawmill, he bought a sawmill and, and we wrecked it, we put it, put it together and started this, had a good sawmill and started sawing logs, started cutting ties and, and pole barns, four by six by sixes for pole, by, pole buildings and we did that for a couple of, uh, for a couple of years. Then we uh, also uh, sold logs out of, the, out of, of this, uh, our timber sales, and we bought 20 acres back, back then and built a house. Did and, you log? How, how we, did you log the place? I've always wondered. Did you log or did you yeah, have somebody? We did, we you logged, you it, logged it, really. Okay. Well, we had a sawmill there and logged it. And, how did you well, get the stumps out and stuff? Did you have. Well, Cause it was just a field. As long as I can remember, it's a field. Yeah. Well, uh, they came out little by little. You know, we had I don't know. I just we pastured it, then the logs kind of stumps kind of really deteriorate partially, and then we had got somebody in. We, yeah, we we had a neighbor okay. in that had a DA cat. That okay, came pushed him out. Pushed him out too. Okay. Yeah, sure. That's really okay. Good. Then you lived in um, this place called Rexford, Montana, or also known as West Kootenay. Um, it's tucked all the way up against the Canadian border. Our home was about a mile from the Canadian border. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, just a, and we'd go up there sometimes. You know, visitors would be interested in going to Canada, so we go up there to the border. You know, stick our legs through the fence or hands or whatever. Um, and then we're also close to the Idaho border, so it's all the way in the really in the northwest corner of Montana. Um, but then in, in that was in 1975. You know, Dad, and Mom moved there, and then 1992. Uh, we made another move, the only move that I was involved with, but uh, that's what we moved to Libby, Montana, which is where we still live now. So, um, kind of the same reasons you moved from Indiana, Dad, you moved, decided to move down here to Libby. And when we, we came here, uh, Dad was always an entrepreneur, still is, and uh, he bought 830 acres, is that right? Yes. And all in one track, and that was a, really a miracle that that we were able to do that. There's nothing like that available really on the market today with this type of, it had a hay field, uh, timber, and the first thing that we did when we moved here is we built a uh, building for a future store. That's where we lived in that building uh, for quite a quite a few, for a few years until, until we built the house that we're sitting in right now. And uh, of course I was still at home so I helped with all of those things. Um, but. Uh, Tell us a little bit more, I guess, Dad, about is there anything you want to say about the move down here or the, the early years of living in Libby or...? Well, this is a kind of a, 
really touch this subject because I don't want to uh, offend people and I don't want to get uh, crossways with anybody that thinks we're we're better than them or whatever. But there was when after we lived in Rexford for a number of years, uh, we had the authorities from the east came out and they changed the the whole uh, philosophy. We could no longer uh, assemble like we were before. We had to only come together every two weeks, which was the norm in Indiana. And so that's it's so kind of kind of Amish tradition to just yeah. have church every two Sunday, every other yeah. Sunday, instead of every it's Sunday. So that just, was just things like that. Just didn't really. Uh, so I I just didn't I didn't want to come against the system and try to buck it because there's I, uh, one person against the whole system just doesn't work and I knew that and I couldn't. So I said, well, we'll just uh, move so when it, when the thing is right. And, and God provided a place here in Libby, Montana. I didn't dream, but my, my, my wildest dream was never that I'd see uh, my, our log home grow like it has here. And that was way beyond my, my, my normal dream. And, but it, it wasn't man that put it, it that made that happen. It was a higher power, and, and, I, and that's where the credit goes. You know, that we are able to, and we we're not here to boast about that either. We the things can change so quickly. Mm -hmm. What I've learned over the years that we can't put our trust in our own thinking, our own ability. There's a higher power that that will determine that. Yeah, so I guess one thing I hear Dad saying here is, you know, when they moved to Libby here, and, the, and Dad's been here now since 92, so it's been, wow, I guess it's coming up on almost 30 years. You know, I guess I hear Dad saying that, you know, maybe there's some things that, that he would have done different, but I, I just, I know that each generation has their own obstacles to face, and each generation has their own battles to, to win, and, and ground to break, and to pioneer through, and, you know... I think it's dad's heart as well as you know his father's heart and my heart that each generation we don't have to go through those same struggles those same battles those same pioneering places but we can move the next generation can go on from where we left off and and now when we look at that generation a lot of times I think we think you know it's not quite the way we would have done it um, and I know my children are probably going to do things differently than I would do them or maybe wish they would be done but I think that's where I hear Dad saying there's, uh, you know, he's re he's released his children and those others to, to walk in those places that him and Mom, you know, weren't able to walk or they fulfilled where they were supposed to walk in. And now it's us to us to walk, us children to walk in this time. And then at some point it's going to be our children. So, and each generation is going to, is going to perceive things a little bit differently and, and hear God um, strategize a little bit differently. And so I think it's, I'm thankful that Dad has that uh, ability to bless us and to, um, you know, set us free and and walk in where we where we need to walk. But is there anything else, Dad, you want to say about anything that comes to your mind? Oh, there's a, a lot of things I could talk about, but but I think if we made it long enough, and and maybe. As things come up later on, yeah. we might do it again. So if you guys really enjoyed this and you want to hear more, I mean, Dad could sit here for hours and days telling stories. And while we're talking about that, well, if you if you enjoy this and you want more, just comment in the description box below. And if there's enough of you that say please, then maybe at some point we'll do another one. But talking about Dad's stories, I'm going to put a plug in for Dad. Uh, some of you, I think I talked about a year ago, I talked about this already. Uh, there's this book right here. It's called Growing Deep Roots, and I don't know if you can see that, but Dad actually wrote that book, and um, that is uh, kind of some of Dad's story, and it's about you know growing up Amish and and his stories of growing up. So a lot of good stories in here. If you guys are interested in this book, I know it would help out Dad, and uh, I think he I think he would enjoy it. It's a lot of lot of good stories. It's kind of self published, so it's not. Um, it's very um, kind of raw form, but it's it's a great book and just go on you can find it on Amazon and and uh, I'll put the link below if you guys want you can just click on the link and it'll take you right through and you can buy the book and you have it uh, in a couple of days. Unfortunately, you it'll be uh, past Christmas time, but 
you can still get it and maybe read it through the winter or whenever. So, um, yeah, a lot, lot of stories in here. So, all right, I just want to say thanks, Dad, for taking the time and, and doing this. We're just thankful that we have Dad and Mom and, with us still, and so it's a real blessing. So, thank you so much for watching. Well, I have to say, uh, we sure, certainly appreciate what the children have done for us, too. It's, it's beyond words. We can't, ex we can't explain it in words. So, yes, we're, we're grateful. I think it goes both ways. So, we're thankful for Mom and Dad, and we're grateful that they're thankful for us. So, um, yes, thanks for watching Montana Haven. Hope you enjoyed this uh, little video, and God bless you, and we'll talk, you, we'll talk with you on the next video.